I'm Nicolas Cage from the new film, National Treasure, Book of Secrets. In the movie, I play treasure hunter Ben Gates, and this time around, things get personal. Ben Gates is in the news again. What do you find now? Atlantis? I'm on a quest to clear my family name as a key conspirator in Abraham Lincoln's death. Your great-great-granddaddy planned the assassination of President Lincoln. But as I go and search for the truth, I discover even greater revelations that could rewrite history once and for all. Those missing pages have been put in the president's book. It contains all of our nation's secrets. Tonight on the Discovery Channel, you'll not only get a first look at my film, but also an unprecedented look inside the world's most mysterious organization, the Freemasons. In the United States, 14 of our presidents have been Freemasons. In almost every mysterious and controversial event, you can, if you look hard enough, find Masonic involvement. We know who killed JFK. We know what happened in Area 51. Don't ask. Stay tuned as secrets, hidden histories, conspiracies, and symbols will be unraveled throughout the night. National Treasure, Book of Secrets, Secret History of the Freemason Special starts right now on the Discovery Channel. January 1989, George Herbert Walker Bush, former ambassador to the UN and former head of the CIA, takes the presidential oath of office, a public event. But unseen by most observers is the Bible he uses to be sworn in. It's a strange volume, illustrated with the symbolism of the world's oldest and most influential fraternity a secretive society called the Freemasons. This same Bible was used to swear in America's first president, George Washington, a Freemason. He would not be the last. In the United States, 14 of our presidents have been Freemasons. They include Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Gerald Ford, and Harry Truman, a Masonic Grand Master and the man who established the UN and the CIA. Some say this is coincidence, but others claim it's evidence of a shadow government controlled by the Freemasons. It's a society of secrets. Uh, they're not very open uh, about what they stand for. Certainly for the last 40 years in, in this country, an absolute dream for conspiracy theorists. For at least three centuries, their members have played a dominant role in business, science, literature, and politics. From Napoleon Bonaparte to Winston Churchill to King Edward VIII. Most of the time, when people try to describe what Freemasonry is, they have a hard time doing it. And so what they end up doing is falling back on telling you people who have been members. And then you say, well, you know, Ben Franklin was a Mason, or George Washington was a Mason. As the Wright brothers took flight, Masons named Chrysler, Olds, and Ford established the auto industry. Colt and Gatling modernized war's most terrible weapons. And Freemasons took control of the movies, led by Louis B. Mayer at MGM, Jack Warner at Warner Brothers, and Daryl Zanuck at 20th Century Fox. Masonic superstars include Clark Gable and John Wayne, Harry Houdini and Mel Blanc, the voice of Bugs Bunny, Abbott, but not Costello, sports heroes like Ty Cobb and Arnold Palmer, even famous names like Buzz Aldrin, and Wendy's founder, Dave Thomas. But who are they? What do they do? And how did they achieve such power? What they did was they developed um, an, another layer, a secret layer um, of organization that no other trade had. And in that sense, they stood out by being different, by being um, secretive, if you like. They traffic in weird icons in secret rituals. People are naturally suspicious any time influential people or groups of people are meeting in relative secrecy. Some assert they're an ancient order empowered by occult knowledge.
Many fear their bizarre initiations indoctrinate new members into a sinister cult. And their ritual reenactments of an ancient murder have some suggesting they are a ruthless conclave willing to kill to protect their secrets and their plans for a new world order. In almost every mysterious and controversial event from Jack the Ripper to the assassination of John F. Kennedy, you can, if you look hard enough, find Masonic involvement. What is the secret? See, that's what they don't want to talk about. There's nothing wrong with secrets. We know who killed JFK. We know what happened in Area 51. Don't ask. Those conspiracy theories have been out there for a long time. Uh, I think part of it is the fact that we've never been out front and open about what we're doing. Today, most major cities are home to a Masonic Lodge, ornate temples closed to outsiders and open to suspicion. I think the feeling on the part of the general public is that there are secrets that we're keeping from them that are making us superior to them. Masonic legends suggest a grand saga that stretches far into the past. Freemasons have over the years claimed that their body goes back to Solomon's Temple or even to the beginning of the world. Um, that it's, that these Masonic rituals, you know, in some cases were created by God. What is the truth behind these fantastic claims? What is the fact and what is the fiction? Freemasonry was practiced by many of America's founders, but some believe they are behind many horrifying crimes. There is the 1982 hanging of an Italian banker with links to the Vatican. There is the 2004 shooting death of a Mason during an initiation rite in New York. There are even wild claims that the killing spree of Jack the Ripper was a Masonic plot. We will penetrate the marble walls of the Masonic Lodge. We'll witness rituals never before seen by outsiders. We'll discover the forbidden password of the third degree. And we reveal the true purpose of the Masonic Creed. In most countries, the people who are in power, mostly they are free nations. For some reason, that's how it happened. It happened in the United States, in England, and in all over the world. How did masonry gain such prominence? What goes on within these lavish temples in London? New York, Philadelphia, or Washington, D.C.? Freemasons have no central authority. Each lodge is independent, yet they are seen by many as part of a global organization. The privacy of Masonic meetings led the people to think that here is a secret government within our government, that we're really not uh, running our own affairs, but we're being manipulated by powers behind the throne. The conspiracy theory you find most attractive says something quite deep-seated about your underlying worldview. Are the Freemasons the most powerful men alive? Or are these just paranoid fantasies? Does their craft go back to biblical times? And do they possess ancient secrets? The questions have been raised. The answers are not what you'd expect. And they begin with an event that has thrust popular fears of a Masonic conspiracy into the international spotlight. The trail of clues begins with a murder. London's Blackfriars Bridge. The scene of a crime that would put the Freemasons in the crosshairs of popular fears. On June 18, 1982, a body was found hanging beneath the bridge. The victim was Roberto Calvi, a 62-year-old Italian banker. On his body was a fake passport and $15,000 cash. Banker, 
On his body was a fake passport and $15,000 cash. His pockets were stuffed with bricks. It appeared to be a murder, staged to send a message. But from whom? Some believe it was the Mafia. Others suggest the symbolism was Masonic. The bricks in the pockets suggested stonemasons. The bridge where the body was found is close to the Masonic Grand Lodge of London. And even its name, Blackfriar, was the nickname for a secretive group to which Roberto Calvi belonged. An outlawed organization called Propaganda Due, or P2. And P2 had been a lodge of the Freemasons. British journalist Rupert Cornwell was in Rome back then, working for the Financial Times. I am Rupert Cornwell, and I am not a Freemason. When Calvi was discovered, the reaction was just amazement. The circumstances of the death were just, just people could not believe it. Roberto Calvi had risen through the ranks of Italy's banking industry to become chairman of Banco Ambrosiano one of Italy's largest private banks. With ties to the Vatican that earned Calvi the nickname, God's Banker. But weeks before his death, Calvi had appeared in court about the disappearance of $1.4 billion from his bank. My name is Conrad Garinger, and I am not a Freemason. Basically, what was going on was vast amounts of money were being laundered through Banco Ambrosiano, shipped overseas to Latin America and, and other offshore banking points, and then disappearing. Within days of the discovery of Calvi's body, British police ruled the death a suicide, a finding many thought to be a cover-up. The circumstances, are, of course, were quite bizarre. Would a person commit suicide by hanging themselves when he had to walk down quite a complicated set of steps and then climb out onto the scaffolding to do this? Later inquiries showed the injuries to his neck were inconsistent with hanging and that he hadn't touched the bricks in his pockets. And at the time of death, the point on the bridge where the rope was tied could be reached by someone standing in a boat. Rupert Cornwell personally met with Calvi two months before his death. He looked like a man who was under extreme pressure. This was a man who was frightened, who was hunted, and who was, I think, aware that the end probably wasn't that far off. Calvi was reputedly a member of the P2 Lodge. I'm John Hamill, and I'm a Freemason. P2 was a lodger under the Grand Orient of Italy. It was taken over by a man called Licio Gelli, who suddenly began to run the proper lodge, which was regularly registered as it had to be under Italian law. But he was also behind it running a clandestine lodge. P2 was established in 1877, and it was a very traditional Italian Freemason lodge. However, in the 1960s, it was taken over by Gelli. And when Gelli infiltrated, the organization, it became a Freemason Lodge with an agenda. Roberto Calvi was Catholic, and the church has long denounced Freemasonry. So why would he become a member of the P2 Lodge? I suspect that Calvi was attracted to P2 because it offered him business opportunities, because it satisfied his interest in the idea of hidden power. His son, Carlo, was 28 at the time of his father's death. My father did not entirely participate in these things because of his own free choice. What happens is that the bank had grown. In order to do that, they had to keep contacts with the politicians. The P2 Lodge was sort of an intermediary of these politicians. So it was uh, more of a constraint than uh, an act of free will. There's evidence, I think, that Banco Ambrosiano was loaning money to P2 and serving as a paymaster for some of the people connected with Jelly. An investigation blew the scandal wide open. It was claimed that Gelly wanted Calvi out of the way for embezzling money. But some believe the plot didn't end with embezzlement. 
The theatrical nature of Calvi's death, the symbolism, authorities calling it a suicide, and the fact that the scheme was conducted within the P2 Lodge made some wonder if there was something more sinister going on. Licio Jelly compiled a list of several hundred people that he targeted. There's evidence that he was involved in blackmailing using pilfered files from the Italian secret services. And he had a plan to basically remake the Italian government along more authoritarian lines. This is the secret world Roberto Calvi had entered. He was actually joining not just a secret society, but a secret society with a very real agenda and a very real conspiratorial agenda to actually seize control of the Italian state. But some claim this was a Masonic scheme. I'm Jim Mars, journalist, author, and I'm not a Mason. And basically, this one's an attempt by a Masonic lodge to take over a modern country and create a right-wing dictatorship. This theory says the plan didn't end with Italy. In the subsequent court cases, you had mysterious deaths, you had uh, accusations of the involvement of George Herbert Walker Bush and Henry Kissinger and the CIA and the Vatican Bank. It was just an, a whole little ball of wax. So don't think that everyone who questions uh, what's going on within Freemasonry is just a conspiracy theorist. This was a conspiracy that was very well documented. Was Calvi's death merely the tip of an iceberg? A glimpse into a world of conspirators, Freemasons, plotting to overthrow a free government and control an entire country. Why would they do this? Who are they? And why do they invoke such fear and suspicion? As it turns out, Charges like these have been leveled against the Freemasons for centuries. Freemasonry began with the stonemason guilds of medieval England, Scotland, and France. Their trade secrets made them valued artisans in the construction of castles and cathedrals. Secret handshakes and other signals were used to identify men as members of the craft. Skilled stoneworkers known as operative Freemasons. By 1700, they had evolved into a progressive gentleman's club and were called speculative Freemasons. Their order grew and spread from England to Europe to America. Masonic lodges established rites of initiation and they kept their activities secret. But what are these secrets? What is their ultimate purpose? Would people kill to protect them? For the first time, cameras have been allowed inside a Masonic temple to record rituals that have been hidden for centuries. Rites based upon a story that links Freemasons to nothing less than the builders of Solomon's Temple. And to another brutal murder that took place 3,000 years ago. There are five million Freemasons in the world today. But who are they? They're known for their charity work, their elaborate temples, and their arcane symbols. But what they may be best known for is secrecy. Much of it centered on initiation rites into the three degrees of Freemasonry. Entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason. These rites go back 300 years, steeped in symbolic meaning. They've also been associated with dark agendas and, some claim, ritual murder. Then die! A shadowy cult established to protect ancient secrets is the premise of Dan Brown's bestseller, The Da Vinci Code, which features a hidden truth. Dan Brown's bestseller, The Da Vinci Code, 
which features a hidden truth guarded for centuries by a fictional cult called the Priory of Sion. But in his next book, The Solomon Key, Brown brings in an organization that is real, the Freemasons, a group that conspiracy theorists say has amassed great power and is willing to destroy anyone who would challenge them. They assert that the Calvi death is one example of how far they'll go to protect their members and their schemes. Another so-called example is the 2004 shooting death of William James in Long Island, New York. Reports claimed it was a Masonic rite. Before he was shot in the head, James was blindfolded, seated in a chair, and surrounded by tin cans. James had gone through most of the initiation process, and he had come to the point where there's a mock shooting um, in which a member of the club was going to pull out a gun, shoot blanks, and then some cans next to the initiate were to be knocked over by someone next to the cans. <coughs> what happened tragically was that the person with the gun reached in his pocket, pulled out a loaded gun rather than the actual gun with the blanks in it. He shot and killed William James. The trigger man was Albert Ide, a fellow Freemason. The New York Masonic Lodge was quick to say that the event was not part of any Masonic ritual. But there were Freemasons involved, and this was enough to create an international sensation. I had pled guilty to second-degree manslaughter and was given probation. He was also expelled from the Lodge. If you break the law and, and you're convicted, then you will either have your membership suspended or, more often than not, thrown out completely and, and not be able to get back in because of what we believe Freemasonry stands for. But if that's the case, then why are Freemasons associated with violent deaths? One reason may be that their initiation rites involve a Masonic legend that goes back 3,000 years. And at the center of the tale is a murder. The story is based on a biblical account found in the Book of Kings. King Solomon built the Temple to God in Jerusalem. His top architect was Hiram Abiff, seen here in the costume beard. Legend says he was an ancient Freemason. Hiram Abiff knew the secret password of the Master Mason, but as the temple neared completion, he was confronted by three lesser stoneworkers who wanted to learn the secret password. A word that would grant them wisdom and power. Would you give me the secret word of a master mason? I cannot. Each one threatened Hiram Abiff with death unless he gave up the secret. But Hiram refused. Wait until the temple is completed. Then die. For that, he was killed with the tools of the Freemason's trade. A death toll sounds, and Hiram's body is removed from the stage. When you act out the role of Hiram Abiff, it's the most dramatic way of learning what your, what your, what your deepest fears are. The three assassins plant an acacia tree over the grave. Then they try to board a ship to flee the realm but they have no permission to leave. Meanwhile, Solomon learns that Hiram is missing, and he orders his men to search for the architect. To the temple and see if he cannot be found. Some time later, the killers are found and are brought to the king of Tyre. All three admit their guilt, and the king orders their execution. Later, Hiram's death is confirmed when his pendant is discovered. And when his body is found, it is carried off to a proper burial. King Solomon then establishes a new word, one that no Freemason will ever speak in public. This word is the passkey to the third degree, one of the Masons' most tightly held secrets. 
That secret word is only, however, a substitute for the true pronunciation and understanding of the Tetragrammaton, or yod heh vav -Hey, or Y-H-V-H, only a substitute. And that word is uh, Mahabon, and which I believe is a corruption of the Hebrew Mahaboneh, which can be translated, what, is this the builder? And Hiram, of course, was builder. My name is Stephen Sukalis, and I'm not a mason. The ritual of the third degree is not about protecting a word. It's about being entrusted with a secret. It's an attempt to make every candidate completely reassess his life. That's why it's dramatic. I mean, it's supposed to be life-changing. But some see this ritual murder as a method of indoctrination into a sinister cult. According to Masonic ritual, if you break your oaths, you, you will be murdered. That is, that is the basic of the oath. And a, as you go up in degrees, the, the punishments become more bizarre, from having your throat slit to having your, your, your chest open perpendicular. In the higher degrees, your, your, the top of your head will be taken off and your brain will be exposed to the, the heat of the, the, the noonday sun. Naturally, the Masons regard all this as absurd. What we have today, unfortunately, is a situation where people now, especially non-Masons, look at what uh, Freemasons do in these dramas, in these plays, um, and believe them to be literally true. And of course, they are not. But if this is the case, then why all the mystery? And why do some believe the Masons maintain their secrets with the threat of murder? The key lies in how Hiram Abiff ties the Masons to another secretive society. The Templar Knights. And to a 500 year conspiracy that some claim has shaped the course of history and created the modern world. War. Revolutions, religious movements. On the surface, they seem to be random events, independent forces all vying for money and influence. But is there a hidden order beneath it all? Are these events in fact orchestrated by a conspiracy of power brokers directing the business of the world through elite organizations and secret societies? When the Bilderberg meets, you know, and um, they're, they're, they were set up by leading Masons, the, the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Most of the key people that get invited to them are Masons. But can any one organization be so powerful ruthless and invisible that it charts the course of history and controls the lives of millions and are they willing to kill to preserve their silent grip on the levers of power freemasonry serves a very important role in conspiracy theories it is undoubtedly the largest single organization which is secret uh, which people know about it's it's international it's found in every country so it's a perfect vehicle to enable an international conspiracy to take effect. The story of Hiram Abiff suggests that the Masons go far back in history to the designers of the Temple of Jerusalem. Some push it back even further to the very founders of civilization. But how do these claims link the Freemasons of ancient times to the corridors of power today? Freemasonry has attracted the rich and the powerful and the influential uh, and uh, certainly has evolved out of its medieval guild roots. It evolved into an organization which did attract opinion formers uh, and it's undoubtedly historically a recruitment tool that uh, you would be joining this group with esoteric secrets going back to Solomon. Solomon's Temple. Solomon. Solomon's Temple is the key. 
Centuries ago, the ruins of the ancient structure served as headquarters for a band of noblemen who relinquished all their possessions to become armed escorts for visitors to the Holy Land during the Crusades. The Temple Knights, the Knights Templar. It was called a new knighthood, meaning these would be warrior monks, not merely monks who prayed all day, but not also only those who fought on the battlefield. So they began as a type of spiritual special forces for Christ, you might say. The Templars were secretive, and they became rich and powerful. But how? Solomon's temple had been the holiest of shrines. It was a storage place for the Ten Commandments. But legend says that in the depths of a stone monument was another treasure of immeasurable value. What is the treasure? Well, some authors claim it's the Holy Grail, some say it's the Ark of the Covenant, some say it's the embalmed head of Jesus Christ, some say it's the lost writings of, of Jesus Christ, and of course the other one that is the hottest is that it's in fact none of these physical things, but it in fact is the secret of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. But another theory says what the Templars discovered were two sculpted columns copied in Masonic temples today. The Pillars of Knowledge. What was this secret knowledge that so empowered the Templars? There's no end to the speculation. And the Knights Templars uh, were gaining this information under the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, which had been collected and gathered there from the ancient mystery schools of Egypt and Greece. And these were the ancient secrets that had been passed down since the beginning of time. The Templars' mix of secrecy and wealth fueled rumors of heresy. Stomping on the cross. Homosexual rites. Even worshipping the head of John the Baptist, or the image of Baphomet, the pagan idol. The Templars were accused of blasphemy by royals like King Philip of France, who grew jealous of the knight's wealth and influence. The King of France decided that he was going to acquire their wealth. And so on the 13th of October, 1307, the, uh, the French authorities arrested all the Knights Templar that they could find in France. Historians say the Templars were destroyed. But according to some, the Knights did not disappear. Rather, they went into hiding in the ornate shrines they built across Europe and wielded their power in secret. In one account, the Templars are said to have joined forces with knights from Malta, warriors who turned to piracy under a symbol we all know today, the skull and crossbones. It's a depiction of the Templars' burial custom of severing a dead man's legs and arranging them as a cross. This emblem provides an iconic link between the medieval Templars and today's power elite. Most infamous among them is Yale University's Skull and Bones Club. Since 1832, this ultra-private fraternity for the sons of America's most powerful families has included Presidents Taft, Roosevelt, the senior George Bush, George W. Bush, and Senator John Kerry. Like the Templars, the Skull and Bonesmen keep their rituals and their agenda secret. But they proudly fly the pirate banner, a symbolic connection with the Templars, and so it's claimed, with the mystical origins of Freemasonry. Freemasonry is the latest incarnation of what is known as the underground stream. This is a hidden stream of knowledge that has been passed down since uh, the dawn of human history. Conspiracy theorists say there's an unbroken chain stemming from the builders of the pyramids to Hiram Abiff 
to the Templar Knights, to the Masons of the 18th century, and today. If it's true, this knowledge must be more than trade secrets of stonemasons. It was found, after all, in Solomon's temple, God's own house. Does this mean the Freemasons are a religion unto themselves? Their religious trappings have inspired opponents, from those who accuse them of heresy to those who claim they are in league with Satan himself. Did you know that over five million people worldwide are Freemasons and have beautiful temples through all the major cities of the world? In my latest film, National Treasure, Book of Secrets, my personal journey for the truth leads me to some well-known destinations where secrets are hidden in the most unsuspecting places. Are you saying there's a treasure map in the Statue of Liberty? The only question is, which Statue of Liberty? Exactly. A lot of people don't know that the French have their own Statue of Liberty looking towards New York. The one in New York is looking towards Paris. With all the amazing places we went, we all fell in love with South Dakota. At Mount Rushmore, we started to feel what the stone was before it was carved into American faces. I've been telling my friends about all of these amazing caverns underneath Mount Rushmore, and nobody believes me. Now, back to the secret history of the Freemasons. In this life, if you want to receive your crown, keep fighting in the name of Jesus. It may sound like a church, but this, in fact, is a meeting of a Masonic lodge. Like a church, all nationalities are welcome, and in recent years, women as well. But it raises a question often asked by outsiders. Are the Freemasons, in reality, a religion? The prime qualification for entry into Freemasonry under um, our Grand Lodge on, on, on the ones we're an amateur with around the world, is a belief in God, a belief in the Supreme Being. We don't define who that should be, what your religion should be, but we believe that Freemasons should have a religion and practice it. But Masonic lodges adopt some of the trappings of a traditional church. We're entering the space that is most important in Freemasonry, central to the furniture of a lodge is the altar. On it, you will find in an operating lodge the volume of the sacred law. What does that mean? It is basically a reference to whatever holy books that the members of the lodge believe in. I am Akram Elias, a Freemason, the senior grand warden of the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of Washington, D.C. All religions are welcome Yet the teachings of masonry itself have a religious ring. One that we hear quite often is that uh, we attempt to make um, good men better. We can't make bad men good. The other one, the one that I prefer, is a peculiar system of morality. And peculiar, of course, here means unusual, special. So in a peculiar system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols of which we have lots and lots and lots of So you have a situation where a symbol, um, let's take for example the letter G. Um, some people believe that that stands for God in, within Freemasonry. Some believe it stands for goodness, the goodness of the human spirit. Others believe it stands for geometry. Um, and so in that way, uh, it can mean many things to many people within the organization. I've got on my lapel pen a square and compasses, and the center of it is the letter G. And it reminds me to square my actions by the square of virtue, to circumscribe my passions and desires, and to remember that God is in the center of my life. A moral system based on a belief in God. It certainly sounds like a church. Yet the Masons insist they are not. Freemasonry is not a religion, although it incorporates into its rituals um, many symbols and ideas and motifs that appear to have many symbols and ideas and motifs that appear to have some kind of religion or, or religious or philosophical overtone. 
are not a religion. We're not a substitute for religion. We support religion. We expect people to have a religion. You can't come in if you're, if you're an atheist or an agnostic. You must have a belief. Um, but it is not our job to tell people what their religion should be. It's important to recognize this religious dimension and not to deny it. And it is a problem for deeply committed Orthodox Christians. And for many outsiders, this is a problem. Masonry is certainly a religion, and um, it has every, every aspect. It's, it's certainly much more ornate than the most Protestant churches. It's a religion of um, secularism, essentially. As a Christian, I do believe in the one universal uh, creative force. The Masons call it the great architect of the universe. It's the universal mass mind, uh, which pretty well qualifies as God. But is this supreme architect the God of the Bible or someone else? I maintain that you cannot be an informed Mason and a Christian at the same time without being in some kind of rebellion against God. It's a, it's a conflict between Jesus, Christ, and, and Satan. This fanciful claim is supposedly proven by Masonic references to pagan Egypt. Connections to the alleged heresies of the Templar Knights and their use of strange symbols, including the star or pentagram, to some a satanic icon. The Catholics and now the Protestants, the fundamentalist evangelical Protestant groups, uh, people like Pat Robertson, are fitting the Freemasons, or at least the leadership of the Freemasons, into a conspiracy to impose a new world order. Is all the talk of harmless rituals and wholesome values just a smokescreen for something darker? Some point to moments in history where the Masons have been accused of monstrous acts. And one of them involves the most notorious mass murderer of them all. Is history made in secret? The pyramids, Solomon's temple, the Templar Knights. Is there a link between these and other historical landmarks forged by the Freemasons? Are they more than builders? Are they the architects of an ancient conspiracy to control the world? At first glance, they appear innocuous, a social club that encourages brotherhood, community, and personal improvement. But is this a facade for something more sinister? Time and again, shocking murders have been blamed on the Masons. And some say they are warnings to those who challenge the power. Or betray their secrets. Some even link a Masonic conspiracy to the most notorious murderer of all time. I suppose one of the areas where we have and, and continue from time to time to be brought into conspiracy theory is the Dracula Ripper saga. In 1888, five women were knifed to death in the streets of London. Their throats slit, bodies mutilated, internal organs removed. And though these deaths took place in London, the assassin was never identified. For a few conspiracy theorists, the methods of Jack the Ripper point to the Masons. At 1.44 a.m. on the 30th of September, 1888, the body of Catherine Eddowes was found in a corner of Mitre Square. The mutilations to her face and to her body were fairly extreme. People have since linked on to a possible Masonic connection to this. Firstly, two inverted V's were cut onto her cheeks. Some people have claimed if you put those two V's together, you would actually get an M denoting a Mason. Secondly, half her apron was removed, and obviously the, the link to aprons and Masons is, is obvious. Thirdly, the name Mitre Square, where well, people are saying obviously the Mitre and the Square both being a Masonic symbol.
According to the conspiracy theory, when the police entered the picture, the Masonic connection only deepened. At 2.55, just an hour and ten minutes after the murder of Captain Ellis in Mitre Square, PC Alfred Long was walking up Goulston Street. He found half a white apron. Jack had cut it away from the body and used it to wipe his knife clean and wipe his hands whilst running away from the murder scene. But it was what was found next to the apron that since become the stuff of legend. There was an inscription apparently left on the wall and it was something to the effect that it was the Jewish, J-U-W-E-S, that did it. In the American Masonic rituals, there is in one part of one of the ceremonies reference to a group of three people who were titled Jubilo, Jubilar, Jubilum. These three so-called Jews were the men who wanted to force the secrets of a master mason from Hiram Abiff. What's more, when the inscription was discovered, it was promptly destroyed on the orders of a Freemason. The key thing which was supposed to be it, and it's, it's, it's where the one Freemason who was involved, the, the commissioner of, of the Metropolitan Police. The charge is that Police Commissioner Charles Warren, himself a Mason, had the inscription removed to cover up evidence of a Masonic involvement. But why would a Mason go on such a killing spree? There are a number of writers who have claimed that this was a Masonic conspiracy um, for a number of different reasons, but generally um, a conspiracy to preserve the status quo. That status quo was the position of Prince Albert Edward, grandson of Queen Victoria. Allegedly, he had an affair with a prostitute named Annie Crook, who became pregnant. Four of her fellow streetwalkers knew of this. So, all five women were murdered to keep the pregnancy secret. And the man who supposedly did it, Dr. William Gall, was the Queen's private physician. He was also a Freemason. Did a royalty-connected Mason surface into the public spotlight just long enough to protect a friendly prince? Is this how they operate? And why they've endured for so long? Freemason legends portray the craft as quietly existing for thousands of years. But modern speculative Freemasonry came into being at a very particular time and place. A critical period in history that saw the fall of kings and the rise of what some fear is a new world order. How did the modern fraternity of Freemasons begin? And why do they keep secrets from the outside world? I'm Jim Mars, and I am not a Mason. Although Freemasonry is uh, outwardly a, a very benign and, and philanthropic organization, there are dark sides to it. My name is Stephen Sukalis, and I'm not a Mason. If it were a secret society, many of us would not know about it. It's not a secret society in that sense, but it is a society with the secrets. The modern Masonic movement is usually recognized as having started in 18th century England. The Grand Lodge of England was founded in 1717 in London. Near St. Paul's Cathedral, a group of gentlemen convene at a pub called the Goose and Gridiron and formally pledge their allegiance to a club they call the Freemasons. While the original operative Freemasons were the stonecutters of the Middle Ages, this new Masonic order is made up of merchants and aristocrats who indulge in secret passwords and costume dramas. They call themselves speculative Masons who discuss progressive ideas and speculate on the meaning of life. Since who discuss progressive ideas and speculate on the meaning of life. What happens in 1717 um, is still relatively mysterious. We've only got one 
broadly contemporary account of the foundation uh, of the Grand Lodge. There are no reports in uh, contemporary newspapers. Freemasons have a long tradition of secrecy. Uh, some of the original secrets of the Freemasons were the operative secrets. They knew how to cut stones so it would be as strong as possible if they put it across a lentil. They knew how to make arches. Very importantly, they knew how to make squares. Getting the best jobs meant proving you were a member of the craft. A stonemason who is traveling from one building site to another, how is he going to identify himself to someone else that he is a stonemason? Well, he's got handshake. And this sh only shows that they are stonemasons. The operative tradition of keeping trade secrets carried over to the speculative masons who established handshakes, passwords, and rituals to create a sense of membership in their club. Just a few years after the meeting at the Goose and Gridiron, the Freemasons had hundreds of members, several branches called lodges, and a written constitution filled with fantastic symbols, signals, tools, and hand clasps. Even their own alphabet. They eventually devise a hierarchy of novice masons, master masons, and grand masters. Three levels called degrees, each one reached through a secret initiation and rewarded with a password that members swear never to reveal under penalty of death. New members are never asked to join. They must do the asking, and they are approved by secret ballot. A white ball for a yes vote, a single dark stone, means exclusion. It's the origin of the term black ball. Speculative Freemasonry was formally established in 1717. But some claim the craft goes back well before that meeting at the Goose and Gridiron. Just seven miles from Edinburgh, Scotland, on the estate of one of the great Scottish clans, stands Roslyn. For 500 years, one of the most intriguing churches ever built. I studied this certainly 40 years. I have to say that the place is as big a mystery to me almost as it was when I first began as to why it was built. It is a total mystery. William Sinclair was the Masonic Grand Master of Scotland and a favorite theory says he was a descendant of the Templar Knights. According to the legend, after their destruction by Philip of France in 1307, some of them retreated to Roslyn to preserve their secrets in ritual and in stone and to nurture their hatred of the French crown. Centuries passed. In the 1700s, they allegedly re-emerged as the Freemasons. And in 1789, after five centuries in hiding, they retaliated against the King of France by igniting the French Revolution. Or so the legend goes. It was an event unprecedented in history, the overthrow of a sitting king. Certain royals, who couldn't accept that the people could stage such a revolt, decided that the revolution had been a Masonic act of revenge. This is the origin of all modern conspiracy theories, the terrifying idea that history is made in secret. There's something in us that desires to belong to the inner ring, that circle that, that believes in certain secrets of which the outside is, is not privy to. If you can build a conspiracy theory about Jews or Freemasons or Catholics or humanists or any other any group, you're starting to make sense of a chaotic world because there's an invisible hidden hand that's secretly uh, operating in everything. And that has a certain psychological appeal. But the conspiracy theories don't end with France. Even more ambitious is the idea that the Masons established an entirely new country of their own. The United States. Did you know that 14 of our United States presidents were Freemasons? Maybe they're doing something right.
Is that coincidence or evidence of a shadow government? In the second installment of National Treasure, my quest to clear my family name in the Lincoln assassination leads me to the Book of Secrets, a book for President's eyes only. There is a book, and it has the information you need. There's this book that's been passed down from George Washington to George Bush, but nobody talks about it, and that's the Book of Secrets. And the place that it's kept is only known by the current president. Where is it? I can't tell you about the book. We discover new things every day. You never know what secrets of the past still remain to be discovered. Oh, Area 51, it's getting you, says. Shh. We don't have time. We don't have time. Now, back to the secret history of the Freemasons. It is one of America's great ironies that the leadership of a country founded upon the principles of liberty and open government is deeply entwined with a cryptic club where modern men masquerade as ancient kings. It's been this way since the beginning. It's December 1773. In a Boston tavern, a group of wealthy businessmen hold a secret meeting. Among them, Paul Revere and John Hancock. Both are Freemasons. The Inn is a Masonic hangout. Tonight's agenda, however, is not ritual, but revolution. For years, these upper-class colonists have initiated members by acting out strange costume dramas. Now, fed up with English taxes, they dress up to initiate a new nation. They disguise themselves as Mohawk Indians, sneak aboard a British merchant ship, and dump a cargo of tea into the harbor. This act of sabotage becomes known as the Boston Tea Party. Citizens are burned up about unfair taxes. Uh, they're going to take the tea and throw it in the harbor, and of course it's widely held to be a Masonic event. Two and a half years later, John Hancock and his brother Masons formally declare America's separation from Great Britain. At least nine, and perhaps as many as 50 Masons, sign their names to the Declaration of Independence. Without the Masons, there may never have been an independent America. Yeah, I think you could safely say that modern society would have been very different um, in its culture, in its aesthetics, uh, in its outlook, if we had not had Freemasonry developing in the way it did in the 18th century. But conspiracy theory holds that this government is not just dominated by Masons, but is controlled by them in secret. They even model their capital city on the cryptic geometry of the Masonic craft. Masonic icons appear throughout the bricks and marble facades of Washington. Even the laying of the cornerstone of the U.S. Capitol was overseen by George Washington, dressed in full Masonic regalia. The gavel in American courtrooms comes from Masonic tradition. And the Washington street grid just north of the White House traces out a star which appears in Masonic symbolism but which some insist is a satanic pentagram. There is also the shocking symbolism on the reverse of the U.S. dollar bill. America's founding fathers appointed a committee to design an emblem for the infant nation. Ben Franklin, the only Freemason on the panel, suggested a pelican feeding her young. But the idea was shot down in favor of an eagle with 13 arrows in its grasp. And then there is the all-seeing eye atop a pyramid, apparently referring to Egypt. Whose images are duplicated throughout the U.S. Capitol. These icons on the dollar are accompanied by three Latin words, Novus Ordo Seclorum. A reference, so it's claimed, to a new world order run by anyone from either president Reference, so it's claimed, to a new world order run by anyone from either President Bush to Lucifer himself. 
Finally, this little trick. M A S O N. Letters that form both the square and compass of masonry and the Star of David. More proof, some contend, of Masonic control of our economy and our government. These fears go back to the dawn of the Republic and they become a political force after an event that takes place exactly 50 years after the signing of the Declaration. In 1826, Masonry finds itself implicated in a murder. William Morgan of New York is a Mason who boasts that he's about to publish a book revealing the Brotherhood's deepest secrets. He's also a notorious troublemaker, now in jail for petty theft. After his arrest, three strangers pay his bail, but they cart him away and he's never seen again. His abductors were masons. He was, he was forced into a carriage and driven off, shouting, murder, murder. We don't know what happened after that. His body was never found. Six men were tried, though none for murder. And their light sentences drew outrage when people found out that the prosecutor and many jurors were masons. But whatever happened to Morgan, uh, the following cover-up led the people to think that here is a secret government within our government. And so from this uh, unauthorized event, a wave of anti-masonry swept the country. As the hysteria multiplied, New York's 227 Masonic lodges dwindled to 41. There was a suspicion of the Masons' secret rituals and the politicians who took part in them. American Masonry recovers from the Morgan episode. Throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, it expands, reaching a peak after the Second World War. It also flourishes in Britain and Western Europe. But the eerie rituals and symbols continue to make Masonry a target for dictators and demagogues, popes and prelates. Men jealous of their power and suspicious of their secrets. In America, Freemasonry no longer excites much interest. But some still insist that there is a network of godless conspirators bound to a death pledge who infiltrate the institutions that run the world. They're basically running a racket, right? They're racketeers, essentially. They're cutting corners. They're favoring each other. They basically think they made the country its theirs, and um, they're above government. They've basically appointed themselves, and uh, people have to decide for themselves if, uh, if they want that to continue. Beneath the conspiracies, behind the symbolism and secrecy, we reveal at last the truth of the Freemasons. Or a shadow government, a harmless social club, or a satanic cult. What is the reality behind the Masonic conspiracy theories? It turns out there is less here than meets the all-seeing eye. If it were a secret society, n many of us would not know about it. I mean, <laughs> I mean good, good, good heavens, we, we, we're in the yellow pages. We put bumper stickers on our car. Despite legends that suggest an ancient past, the Freemasons are a modern phenomenon. What began as stonecutter guilds in the Middle Ages evolved into progressive social clubs by the 18th century, and they employed the tools of the construction trade as metaphors for building a better society based on equality and moral conduct. Their knowledge of geometry and engineering makes them leading thinkers at a time of free thought and political change. But their symbols and secrecy make them suspect to kings and churches who don't like secrets or political change. Maybe they see this as part of a conspiracy and they're going to look for villains. And Freemasons make great villains. 
But in reality, their rituals are harmless and their symbols no more ominous than a company logo. Some symbols attributed to the Masons aren't Masonic at all, like the Great Seal of the United States. The all-seeing eye above the pyramid is not Masonic, nor were the people who selected it. A committee was formed by the Congress just after the Declaration of Independence was signed. The first three members were John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin. Only one of those three men was a Freemason, and that was Benjamin Franklin. Franklin suggested several designs, none of them involving an eye or a pyramid. Non-Masons chose that design. The pyramid is unfinished because it signifies a solid foundation for a country that's always a work in progress, under the eye of Providence. It doesn't refer to Egypt because Masons didn't build the pyramids. That's a myth. If the Great Seal were a symbol of America's founding Freemasons, it would have appeared on the dollar long before it did. In 1935, under President Franklin Roosevelt. Henry Wallace, uh, Roosevelt's vice president, thought that the Great Seal was a Masonic emblem. And he suggested to, to Roosevelt, who both of them were Freemasons, that it would be nice to put this on the back of the dollar bill. The words Novus Ordo Seclorum do not mean New World Order, but rather a new order of the ages, referring to the first modern democracy. And as for the parlor trick of finding the word Mason on the Great Seal, that's all it is, a trick. Likewise for the satanic pentagram supposedly formed by the streets of Washington. There are some uh, conspiracists that believe that the Freemasons made some kind of satanic symbol uh, just north of the White House with a, with a pentagram, but the pentagram's not even complete. Rhode Island Avenue doesn't go all the way to uh, Connecticut. Uh, if we're so darn powerful, how come we couldn't make a complete star? Nor did the Freemasons build Solomon's Temple. That's a story invented by the Scottish Rite Lodges. The temple's designer, Hiram Abiff, is mentioned in the Bible, but only briefly and there's no account of his murder. It's a purely Masonic myth, and it's a Masonic myth that we can trace back quite a long way. So he's a personification of a belief system. The Templar Knights were based in the ruins of Solomon's Temple, but they found no secret knowledge. They didn't go into hiding when they were disbanded, and they didn't resurface as the Freemasons, nor did they ignite the French Revolution. It's a claimed heritage, it's a legendary heritage, but I can't give you any, uh, any historical evidence to support it, but it's a lovely story. <laughs> and while Rosalind's builder was William Sinclair, it wasn't this William Sinclair, the Masonic Grand Master. Rosalind was built by his ancestor three centuries earlier, in the 1440s, before the Freemasons were formally established. The Catholic Church opposed Masonry because churches didn't like secret organizations, period. And they objected to Masonic support for democracy and church-state separation. These ideas did, however, make them popular with America's founders. The whole American experiment is in part about separation of church and state. That at one time was a very radical notion. Among those radicals were those who threw the Boston Tea Party. But was it a Masonic plot? The Boston Tea Party was planned in the Green Dragon Tavern. Uh, indeed, the Freemasons were involved, but so were the non-Masons. Every man that was in the tavern that evening was pressed into service. The group responsible was the Sons of Liberty, only some of whom were Masons. Only nine of the 55 signers of the Declaration of Independence and only one out of three American presidents are known Masons. None out of three American presidents are known Masons. Neither of the Bushes are Masons. And Yale's Skull and Bones Club has nothing to do with the craft. Consequently, 
the senior Bush's service at the UN and the CIA had nothing to do with the fact that a Freemason, Harry Truman, established those institutions. As for claims that the Masons are a murderous cult, if there's no age-old conspiracy, there's no need to kill for it. William Morgan's disappearance was the work of renegades. It was not an official act. The shooting death of William James in New York was an accident, not a Masonic rite. As for the idea that Jack the Ripper murdered five prostitutes to protect the reputation of a Masonic prince, everything you've read about Freemason links to Jack the Ripper is the work of fiction. At the time, no one suggested a Masonic plot. That theory wasn't concocted until the 1970s, and it was based on an admitted hoax. Then there's Roberto Calvi, the Italian banker with the missing $1.4 billion who belonged to the P2 Lodge. This was another case where claims of Masonic involvement came as an afterthought. But it was quite some months after the event and when, when people started to doubt whether it was suicide um, that suddenly, rather like the Ripper case, the, the, the Masonic element suddenly comes in, oh, it's the Masons again. The reality is that the P2 Lodge had been hijacked by criminals as a front for doing business in powerful circles. It was a wonderful gift to the conspiracy theorists. Freemasonry as a movement didn't benefit at all from any of the, the financial improprieties, and Freemasonry really wasn't involved. The fact that Calvi's hanging took place near London's Grand Lodge means nothing. And the bricks found in Calvi's pockets are not emblematic of Freemasons, who are stonecutters, not bricklayers. In October 2002, Forensic experts ruled out death by suicide. And in 2006, four men were charged with the crime. None of them are Freemasons. So, if the grand conspiracy is fiction, what is the reality? For the first time, cameras record a Masonic initiation, and you can judge for yourself. For hundreds of years, the Masons have been wrongly accused of manipulating global institutions with occult powers and clandestine plots. At the core of these fears is their secret rite of initiation, a ritual that allegedly indoctrinates the power elite into the Masonic world. What is the reality behind the rumors? The initiation ceremony is um, something which has a huge effect on, on, on the individual. Now, cameras have been allowed in to record the entirety of a ceremony that has generated centuries of fear and paranoia. The secret initiation into the first degree. As the process begins, the new entered apprentice is alone. He is instructed to knock on the door of the lodge room. Merciful master, there is an alarm at the door. Attend to the alarm. He is then led up to the officers of the lodge who begin the proceedings. My brother, you have this evening been obligated by the very solemn and weighty ties of the Master Mason. Having voluntarily assumed these obligations, you have been taught to wear your apron as a Master Mason or so wearing it among us at the moment. You have a way to travel that is extremely perilous. You will be beset by dangers of many kinds and may perhaps meet with death, as did once befall an eminent brother of this degree. You will therefore suffer yourself again to be hoodwinked, repair to the sacred altar of Freemasonry, and there kneel and pray. The initiate is then guided to the altar. There are three lesser lights around the altar. When the candidate is being initiated, it is dark. And when he sees the light, those three lesser lights help him see what is here. 
the volume of the sacred law and the universal symbol of Freemasonry, the square and the compasses. In the first degree, the candidate is blindfolded, symbolizing he is in darkness and in need of further light. The initiate then prays to the God of his choosing. Amen. He's then stood up and is guided through a reenactment of the legend of Hiram Abiff, a must for every new entered apprentice. You now represent another, no less than our Grand Master Hiram Abiff. The grand architect who was the builder of King Solomon's Temple. The stonemasons of Scotland had two ceremonies. The entered apprentice degree equated to birth. So you are a new member. You are born, if you like, as a Freemason. The fellow of craft degree, or the second degree, is entirely focused on education, um, uh, being a good citizen, and so it, it equates to life. But the Scottish Rite saw the need for something more. So what's the third and last part of human beings' uh, existence that is missing here? Well, it's obviously death. Grand Master Hiram and Biff, I am glad to have met you thus alone. This is an opportunity I have long sought. Behold, the temple is near completed, and I demand the secret word of a Master Mason. Wait until the temple is completed and you shall receive the secret word of a master mason. If not, you cannot. Cannot. Speak not to me of time nor place. Give me the secret word of a master mason. I cannot. Then die. Like Hiram Abiff, the entered apprentice is confronted by the three lesser stonecutters, Jubila, Jubilo, and Jubilum, each of whom attacks him. You now have a complete cycle, if you like birth, life, and death. Grand Master Hiram Abed, for the last time I demand of you the secret word of a Master Mason or I will take your life. My life you may have, but my integrity never. Then die. This ritual, based on the completely invented story of Hiram Abiff, is not a death threat, as some have claimed. And Hiram Abiff represents the ego. And the ego has to be slain before it can, the spirit can rise free. Grandmaster Master Hiram Abiff, I heard you cavilling with Jubala and Jubilo, and from them you have escaped, but from me never. My name is Jubalum. That which I propose is that which I perform. I hold in my hand an instrument of death. If you refuse me now, you do so at your peril. I say, give me the secret word of a Master Mason. I will not. Give me the secret word of a Master Mason. I cannot. Grand Master Hiram Abiff, I demand of you for the last time the secret word of the Master Mason. Crawford, wait until the temple is completed, and I will do my best to serve you. Then die. And with that, the initiate is carried out to take his place among his brother Masons. That's it. No sacrilege, no sacrifices, no Satan. Just fake beards candles the symbols of the stone cutters trade and some amateur acting this is what all the fuss has been about this is the work of the notorious cult that so many accuse of sinister plots and ancient conspiracies Masonic ritual is meant, I think, it uses ritual as an instructional technique and it tries to stimulate the candidate into thinking about certain ideas. Ideas no more controversial than the encouraging of strong character and good citizenship. It all seems little more than a well-funded boys club for grown-ups, complete with secret handshakes mysterious code words, spooky symbols, words, spooky symbols, a comfy clubhouse, and no girls allowed. And even this is changing. 
Today, membership is expanded to everyone. As a result, the modern world is reshaping Freemasonry a lot more than they are shaping the modern world. You're watching the National Treasure Book of Secrets, Secret History of the Freemasons Special. How fast can we get to Buckingham Palace? Now, here's a look at my new movie, National Treasure Book of Secrets. The theaters, December 21st. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you one of the missing pages from the diary of John Wilkes Booth. It's the names of the Lincoln conspirators. Thomas Gates. Your great-great-granddaddy planned the assassination of President Lincoln. It can't be. National Treasure Book of Secrets is going to have to do with the 18 pages missing out of John Wilkes Booth's diary. That's, that's quite something, isn't it? Booth kept a diary. The diary does have missing pages. In fact, 18 pages have been torn out. And of course, a mystery began almost immediately. What was on those pages and where are they? It's a cipher. Yes. Booth is unusual as an assassin. Are you Thomas Gates? Because he was someone with something to lose. John Wilkes Booth was a very famous actor, and everybody knew him. He was popular, rich, successful as a star. His father was a fine actor. As an entertainer, Booth could travel freely through the North and the South without arousing any suspicion whatsoever. Booth was actually on the balcony during Lincoln's inauguration. He was dating a senator's daughter. He was so tightly wound into the government, and no one had a clue until the very night he pulled the trigger. Booth thought he could change history. If the South won and prevailed, then he wouldn't be put in jail, he'd be a hero. We actually know that John Wilkes Booth was part of a larger conspiracy. It's never mentioned in our history books. Maybe what you thought was the truth isn't actually the truth. If any of these missing pages could be discovered, it would be phenomenal. The murder of Abraham Lincoln is still the greatest single crime ever committed in American history. The missing page is the last and final clue to clearing Ben Gates' family's name. We gotta do something. I need to see the page. For hundreds of years, outsiders have believed that the Freemasons are the architects of anything from a political conspiracy to a religion. Ironic, considering the reality. The two things we can't discuss at Masonic meetings are the two things which divide everybody, which is, of course, politics and religion. I think the biggest secret about Freemasonry is that there are actually no secrets. Our opportunity to record these rites is part of a new effort by the Freemasons to reach out into the community to explain themselves. While still maintaining a sense of privacy, it's a way of asking that we not only question those who keep the Masonic secrets, but also the credibility of those who claim to expose them. One of these secrets is the fact that uh, the Earth was colonized by extraterrestrials and that they tweaked with primitive uh, Earth uh, primates DNA and created their worker race, which is Homo sapiens. Freemasonry is the system of control set up by Satan to, um, to oppose the church. The Freemasons have paid a high price for their privacy. People are always going to believe what they want to believe. And unfortunately, conspiracy theories have a great immunity from truth. And the Freemasons make a convenient whipping boy. It's all rather strange when you consider what the Freemasons themselves aspire toward. Masonry has changed my life in different ways. I think I have become a much aware of all the things that surround my life, especially my family, my friends. Changes that are brought about in you as a human being through the process of initiation, those can't be undone. Hi, I'm James Cooper and I'm a Freemason. I am a Prince Hall Freemason. I am a Freemason. I'm a Freemason and I am a Freemason. Hello, I'm Janet Wintermute and I'm a Freemason. In the end, the Freemasons are just normal folks who seek a sense of community and camaraderie that transcends religion, race, and economics. Truth for me is a something which is universal. And I believe that uh, through my involvement with uh, masonry, I have discovered the meaning of that truth. 
For the millions of Freemasons across the globe, the purpose of the world's oldest and most successful fraternity is not to remake the world, but to better themselves. It makes you grow. Grow in uh, responsibility and uh, your faith in your fellow man and helping one another. You take a good man and make him better. And uh, that's what it's all about. Look at this. We cracked the cipher. Thanks for watching the National Treasure Book of Secrets, Secret History of the Freemason Special, here on the Discovery Channel.